we're actually going to get into uh, some of the uh, the papal system. It, the, the pa this is basically when the papacy rises up. It uh, comes into power, and it stays in, the, in power all those years. And, of course, you know if you've been uh, uh, keeping uh, informed at all, you know the Pope's still around. Uh, goes from one to the other, but, but still around, right? And um, uh, so that's where we are. In just a real quick review, in, when we talked about Pergamus and um, these seven churches of Revelation, seven churches of Revelation are mentioned in chapter 1, and they covered Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. We'll get into Scripture in just a moment. But when we were talking about Pergamus dispensation, we said around 320 A.D., this guy by the name of Constantine, the uh, Christian emperor, rose, and he moved his throne from Rome, his Roman Empire emperor, over to Constantinople, which was over here, located around Turkey, which is called Istanbul uh, today. And so we actually had two thrones. One where uh, uh, the uh, the Pope would rule, or actually the Bishop of Rome at that time. And uh, Constantine himself ruled over the empire in, uh, uh, in, in Turkey there. And we also said that we presented this image... So this image comes from uh, Nebuchadnezzar's had a dream in the book of Daniel. He related his dream to Daniel, the prophet, and Daniel was going to give the interpretation. He gave the interpretation saying that Nebuchadnezzar himself was a head of gold. We find out from Daniel's interpretation that what uh, God gave us in that passage was one of the most key, most important keys to understanding biblical prophecies because he Starting with Nebuchadnezzar, the, the head of gold, he told us the whole scenario from the head down, down to the feet, what would happen. Uh, what you don't see here is in the dream, a rock came, hit the image in the feet, and the whole thing crumbled. But what we know from this is that, um, that this would cover the whole period of time from the time that Daniel got that Revelation all the way until Jesus comes and sets up a kingdom which will never pass away. That means forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We said in just a quick, quick review that the head of gold was Babylon. The uh, silver arms was a Medo-Persian. It was a dual empire. Uh, the brass area, the brass tummy and uh, part of the thighs covered the Grecian Empire, and, and then there, there was the Roman Empire, and you can see, just like human anatomy, it splits into two legs. Well, that, there we saw the two thrones, right? One in Rome, one in Constantinople, and of course it will end in, in ten, uh, ten toes. We also talked about, in Pergamus, we started talking about Constantine had his vision, he saw we're not really sure what he had, it's he, what he's seen. We know what he relayed to us. There was this vision, um, the way uh, uh, Eusebius uh, described it, was that um, it was a, a chi and a rho, which is uh, two Greek letters, which um, uh, you can see around that circle there, but many uh, assumed that what it, what, it, what it actually represented was the sun god. Constantine was a worshiper of the sun god. And if you'll study just a little deeper, you'll find out that Constantine didn't just have this vision. He also had a vision sometime before this of the sun god. So it's kind of interesting. It's like he had this vision of the sun god, and then he had the vision of supposedly the you know the kingdom of Christ. So whether this vision was true or not and came from Christ, I really can't say. I know he was successful. He did some wonderful things, uh, like uh, like stopping the persecution of the church, and uh, we we even mentioned how uh, he stopped the abortion of babies in the Roman Empire. And so these some of these things were good, but. It's believed that uh, by most people that Constantine really was not a Christian. He waited to get baptized until the day of his death, 
which most most people don't do that. You know, a thing he continued to worship the the pagan Roman gods, which most people don't do that, right? They get saved, they come out of that. So uh, I'll leave that to you. If um, if you don't remember some of this, just go back over to the DVDs. I know, uh, I mean, I've been through this many times, you know, in my study. So um, uh, hopefully I've been able to uh, bring this information so that all you have to do is go through, you know, you have your notes, um, go through the, the DVDs, and you should be able to uh, get all the, everything I know you should, you should have. So. And um, we saw the, uh, the legs, uh, you know, on that image. Here's that image again. We said that uh, it would represent a split in the kingdom. And uh, if you see on this slide, uh, let me read it here, the, the division of the empire. To face external pressures, the emperor Theodosius divided the empire in 395 A.D. into the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire. So not only did Constantine, you can see Constantinople here. This is after Const Constantine. Constantinople's here. But the empire actually did split into two distinct, different empires. They were totally separate one from another. Okay? And uh, so there had, you had an emperor over on the, on the western. You had an emperor on the eastern side. And they became two separate emperor, empires. There, a lot of people don't realize this when they look at history because it doesn't. It, they didn't call it the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. Maybe in the beginning they might have, but um, they called it the Roman Empire, which was in the West, and then they called it the Byzantine or Byzantine Empire in in the East. And so you, you probably have heard of the Byzantine, the Church, the Orthodox Church, which came out of the Eastern half there. Um, but uh, it, it was all considered the Roman Empire. It split into two, just like the legs prophesied. So you can see how tremendous this prophecy was that Daniel gave through the revelation of this dream. And it's, it's only one of the, the, the significant prophecies from the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is, is absolutely a must and a necessity to unlock the prophecies of Revelation. And the other is true as well. You, you won't understand Daniel without having the, uh, the book of Revelation. They work hand in hand. Then the other prophets come into play as well. And so that really is uh, the, uh, the material that we're going to cover from now on is, uh, is brand new. So um, we're going to read on this slide here. It says, Fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, Gregory, the first, uh, is refer regarded as the first uh, pope and the first true pope by, uh, by most people. You can see that the year there is 590 to 604 A.D. Uh, Gregory was considered a good pope because he labored unceasingly over the purification of the church. That's the Roman you know, the Roman Catholic Church, if you will. So he's trying to purify it. He was sincere about it. He deposed neglectful and unworthy bishops. We saw a lot of corruption was taking place. Corruption was taking place in the ministry all the way back in the time of the Apostle Paul. And so, I mean, you can imagine 600 years later, well, he did, Gregory did try to clean it up, and he opposed the sale of church office, Offices, which was called uh, simony, uh, what they would do is those those positions of of bishopry. They would sell them to the highest bidder. And that's real spiritual, isn't it? You know, it's like and in, in in if you follow uh, the papacy through the years of history that that they were um, uh, really powerful over the uh, they were actually around 1260 years they were in operation there before um, before the French Revolution and Napoleon uh, actually took the pope and threw him in jail but um, uh, the, I mean things things were so bad cardinals uh, offices were sold the even the uh, the position of pope was sold and uh, all these illegitimate kids were running around. The popes had illegitimate kids, and um, they would put them in these prominent positions. And, it, you know, there's all kinds of history on that. There was even a time period that they call the, uh, the time of the harlots or something like that, where 
the harlots basically ruled over the, the throne of the papacy. It got so bad, so much corruption. And yeah, I mean, you can see this. It's, it's not hidden from history if you take a, if you, if you get into it and you, you look at it. There's only so much that we can cover, but I just bring it up for it, bring it up to you. I'm not going to cover that. And so here we're starting in the, uh, fourth, now we're in the fourth church. Of Revelation, which is called Thyatira. Remember that we had Ephesus with Sardis, or Ephesus, Smyrna, and uh, uh, Pergamos, and now we're looking at Thyatira. So in your Bibles, it's Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 is where we start reading. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And when you, when the Bible says that his feet, his feet are like, uh, fine brass, and his, his eyes are like a flame of fire, it doesn't literally mean that his eyes are a flame of fire, or his feet are made out of brass, right? What he's doing is kind of a, 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 a similitude or a, a metaphor uh, saying it, it represents symbolically something, right? And so, I mean, you, we can use our, our own, uh, uh, we, we don't have to look any, for any special revelation about what could be the meaning of this. The, uh, we, we know symbolically the brass was used in representing through the Bible as judgment, a symbol for judgment. Uh, we can go back to the tabernacle. We see, we can see the altar when the, uh, when the animal was put upon the altar, it was a brazen or brass altar. Okay, that's where the penalty would be paid. So we see that Jesus appears. He says he's one who has his feet are standing. He's, he's one who, whose feet, feet represent judgment. And, uh, his eyes are like a flame of fire. If you could imagine, if, if I had a, eyes of flame of fire, you, you would think I could see right through you, right? The eyes that could pierce right into you, right into your very heart. And I believe that's the true meaning here. And this is actually how he appears to John in the first chapter as well. But he's appearing, now he's speaking to this church. He says, unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God. How many have ever heard that the Bible does not really come out and say that Jesus is the Son of God? Have you ever heard somebody say that? A lot of people say, here it is right here. The Muslims say that also. Well, because the Muslims, re- the Muslims say all kinds of things. The Muslims reject almost everything that is in your Bible. And uh, they, in fact, they'll throw everything away except for the Gospels, and then they'll say they don't trust the Gospels because they probably were added to and taken away from. So, I mean, they just make it say whatever they want. But here it is. I mean, you can't get any clearer this than this. Jesus says these things, remember, he, he's dictating to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? These things saith the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet, are like fine brass. It's also, I think it's the only place in the book of Revelation where he actually says anything about himself being the Son of God. So, this church age, this church dispensation we're going to talk and speak about, this is like the worst of the worst. We haven't been to a time yet in the church age where the corruption is so bad. In the um, in this deceit and uh, and the uh, false teaching is so bad, and here he says, "I am the Son of God." Remember, we talked a little bit about. In fact, we talked a lot about about uh, this thing called the Babylonian cult. We talked about the Queen of Heaven, the uh, the gods in the days of the Greek, you know, the Greeks and the Romans and in the mythology, and we talked about Zeus and Apollo and the Queen of Heaven and and so forth. I believe that he's saying son of God here. He's also revealing, he said, you have all these stories about worshiping the gods, but I am the son of God. Remember we said the son of God of the, uh, the pagan myths was Apollo, right? And we see that he is the one who actually is named as rising in the ninth chapter of Revelation from the bottomless pit. 
It says Apollyon, but there are manuscripts that actually come straight out and say his name is Apollo. And so Apollo, Apollyon in Greek, it's the, it is the same name. But here Jesus is revealing, because the corruption is so bad at this church, they're still worshiping false gods. In fact, you'll see that what they've done is they, t- they turned all the false worship of all these false gods, all they did was embrace them. They're still worshiping them. They're just calling them Saint this and Saint that. That's what we end up having here. And Jesus says, I am the, t- I am the Son of God. I have the eyes which can see through to pierce you with flames of fire. My feet are, are like brass ready for judgment. But then he, he actually gives them, before he starts talking about the things that are wrong, he actually gives them an, an accommodation here. He said, I know your works and charity and service and faith and your patience. And he repeats, your works. And the last, in other words, the works to be more than the first. In other words, it's like you, you keep, you, you have good work. You're doing good things. It's not, he, he's not condemning them for the things, the works that they do. What comes out here also with uh, Jesus having these eyes that can see, we, we, he, he knows the revelation comes, he knows what you're doing. He knows what you do. When nobody sees, he sees. You know, a lot of people will, and I have this problem myself, you walk downtown, there's so many people that are begging, right? And most of the time you have to walk right past them. But I do see people putting money here and there, and I have on occasion, I don't, you know, if I, there's so many of them, by the time you got to the train to your, you know, your place of work, your, your wallet would be empty. I mean, that's, that's how bad it is. But, um, every time you do something, every time you reach out to somebody, Jesus saw. There, there's something documented on your, you know, in your, in the books of heaven. When you get, it said, in the judgment, it says the books will be open. Those good things that you do, it's not in vain. Everything follows you. Everything follows you. And so Jesus says, I know your works and your charity. Not only your works, but your charity. And the word charity actually is a word that uh, literally means love. But it's a special type of a, like a selfless love, a giving love, a heart that's not... Uh, you know, there's different kinds of, there's a sexual love, there's a friendship love. This is a love that really cares about someone else. And he says, he sees that, he notices that. And service, any type of service you do. We all have different forms of things that we do in service and ministry. And faith. Uh, he knows our faith, he knows our patience, he knows what we're going through. The only way you can exhibit patience is if you go through a trial. Right? right? If you don't go through a trial, how do you even know you have any patience? You have to go through it. But Jesus knows. And then he says, but, and then he mentions you, the works, and he says, the last though are more than the first. So that's the accommodation. So now, he says, notwithstanding, I have a, it's like your, your mother comes home with your kid and says, oh, you, you know, I, I, I see that you cleaned up your room and, you know, and you took out the trash. Notwithstanding, <laughs> you know, now here comes the other, you know, here comes the belt or whatever. You, you, you know, she's got something to, to, to get on you about. But here, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess. Hmm. We got a mention of this woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. And notice that Jesus doesn't say she is a prophetess. He says she calls herself one. You know, there's a lot of people out there, even in our day, that call themselves prophet and call themselves prophetess and really are not sent from God. In fact, the apostles warned and Jesus warned. He said there would be false apostles, false prophets. They will lead many astray. Well, Jesus said, 
This woman Jezebel calls herself a prophetess, but I, I, there may have been a literal Jezebel that that is being referred to here. But I think um, we're going to we're going to look at the Jezebel in the Old Testament to see what he might be talking about. Uh, why is he mentioning Jezebel? Just like we looked a couple weeks ago when we looked at um, Balaam. We looked at the Old Testament. I, and I made a comment. There's, a, there's about 400 scriptures, or 400 verses, I think, in the book of Revelation. There's actually 800 ties to the Old Testament out of those 400. It's an amazing book. And you, you need the Old Testament to help you understand it. You need, you, when he talks about things like Jezebel, we need to go back and see what, does, what was Jezebel. Because a lot of us don't, may not have ever even heard Jezebel. We don't even know where it's located in in the Bible. So you suffer that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. We actually saw the same thing in the Pergamos church. Remember, they were they were uh, committing fornication and 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 uh, eating things sacrificed to idols. And if I didn't bring it, I think I did bring it up, but I'm going to bring it up now in case I didn't. The fornication here, it could be a literal fornication that's implied here. In fact, I think if you study down through the ages, uh, this, uh, this, what did I, what did I say here? The, the, uh, the Thyatira age, goes from 606 A.D. to 1520 A.D. If you look historically at the leaders within the church structure and organizations, you see a lot of corruption. You see a lot of fornication and adultery. You see, um, uh, I mean, there, there's sometimes where there was uh, like this one pope had 16 sons, all from different married women. And they were his sons. Well, how did that happen? Well, we know how that happened, right? I mean, that's no mystery. Well, when he talks about fornication, foreign, I think literal fornication is going on. But whenever you sacrifice to other, when you're, when you're actually bowing down, when you're worshiping other idols, other gods, that's what God considers a spiritual fornication. He says, and I don't have the scripture right off, but he, he, he talks in the Old Testament, he says how we are married. He says, Israel is married to me. And so when you go after a false god, you're committing spiritual adultery, turning your back on your husband, right? And worship in spiritually, your husband is God, turning your back and worshiping and, and having fornication or adultery, spiritual adultery with another Now think about this. Who's the other? It has to be Satan, right? So anytime you're doing that, God says what you're doing, instead of having normal spiritual relations with with God, with your, your husband, your spiritual husband, you're having it with this other person, and there's only one other person. So whenever, how many would like to have fornication or adultery with Satan? I don't want any, I don't want any nearness at all with Satan, right? What the revelation here is that whenever we go after false gods, whenever we worship false gods, we are worshiping Satan. And he says here, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. One of the things that comes out of the, in, in, throughout these seven churches repeatedly, you'll see, I, yeah, I gave him space to repent, or he, he encourages the church to repent. The book, you know, you've heard of Ten Commandments, and some people will say, well, we're not really under the Ten Commandments. I look at it like this. I, I don't believe we're under the law either. But I believe this. Every word of God is a commandment to us. The Ten Commandments, are it's just a sample. Those are the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down. But we have, we have the word of God. 
I don't think there's anything in here that are suggestions. God is giving us his wisdom and telling us, this is what I want you, this is how I want you to live, this is what I want you to do. And we decide whether we're going to obey or not. So the whole thing is, is filled with, you could say suggestions, I think it's the wisdom of God. And everything is actually a commandment per se. That doesn't mean because you've, you know, because you erred somewhere in one of the, uh, you know, in one of the scriptures that uh, that you're lost, and God, you know, God's going to throw you away. That's why He made it so easy to come back to Him. That's why He says here, "I gave her space to repent," but here's the thing: she repented not. See the judgment. He's going to talk later on when we when we go to the next verse here. The next slide. He's going to talk about some of the judgment that's going to, going to come upon her. But why does it come upon her? Not that it come. And now when I say her, I'm not talking about Jezebel. It's the Church of Thyatira. See, but why does the judgment come? Because she repented not. God gave space. He says, I gave her space to repent of fornication or whatever that sin is, and she repented not. We've all been there. We all know that God, you know, God put his, the Holy Spirit put his finger on us and says, you shouldn't do this. Right? And at first it seems like it's a suggestion, but then the longer, you know, it keep, he keeps bringing it to our attention, we realize that, hey, he's, he's not kidding about this. And for some reason, you know, there's some things that are so nasty, we just, oh, I don't want to, you know, we get rid of her right away. But there's some things that we just, you know, it's like we, we want, there's certain sins that we want to keep. Right? I don't know why, but we all have, we all have that tendency. It's not like, you know, that some of us are good, some of us are bad. We're all bad. And it doesn't mean we're totally bad, but we have some bad stuff. And we want to, for some reason, he said, don't keep that and we want to hold on to it. But here's what he said. He, he gave her space. He always gives us space to repent. But in Thyatira's case, this church, she repented not. Also, I want you to see, it's not Jezebel's fault. The judgment doesn't come upon this church because Jezebel's there. It comes because, look at, be, look at the top here. I have a few things against you because you suffer, suffers that woman Jezebel. In other words, you allow Jezebel to continue. And the fact that she exists is irrelevant. You you invite her in. It's kind of like uh, I don't mean to come back to this all the time, but it, it's it it just seems to be such a good illustration. It's like years ago we didn't reach out, we didn't accept uh, alternate lifestyles. When I years ago when I went to a, I had it was one college class. And I had a college professor, and he was definitely gay. All he wanted to talk about the whole class time for like 12 weeks, every day of class, he always ended up talking about alternate lifestyles. That wasn't his job to, job to be trying to win us over to his philosophy of that alternate lifestyle. But when you accept that, you that's you suffer you're suffering that you're allowing that to continue in your life you you extend the hand you invite it in you're like well i'm not going to be judgmental that's the that's the politically correct police working in your spirit the pc police because if you if you know this thing is is not right you should not be giving it a hand of fellowship that doesn't mean you have to hate you don't hate the person, but you're not comfortable with the sin, right? And when you become comfortable with the sin, that's a dangerous area. Okay? And this is where, that's where this church is. They're comfortable. They allow this Jezebel, who calls herself the prof, to be a prophetess, they recognize her and they allow her to be a prophetess to them. 
They allow her to continue and they listen to her. 